That is, um, here they're called cold hardwood farms. This guy was talking last night was talking about cold hardwood. Mm -hmm. And they're also called from the Cumberlands, which is the west of us, the Cumberland Plateau and Mountain. The brother the first described and by a woman from the University of Cincinnati by the name of Lucy Brown. If you haven't heard of her, she was a she was a groundbreaker in her time in the twenties and thirties. She and her sister uh, studied these forests in southeastern Kentucky and called them the mixed mesophytic, referring to a mixture of trees and these mesophytes, which means plants that uh, prefer cool, moist environments. And so the character, there are 13 characteristics of old growth mixed mesophytic forests. And number one is, as we take them one at a time, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the characteristics, uh, just a few of them that are important for everybody to know, and that is this high species diversity at all levels, herbaceous level, shrub level, tree level. Yellowwood is one of those occasional trees in the forest that add to the diversity. It is not a dominant in the sense of being a major tree with a lot of stems and large trees, but there are others that are. There are at least 10 trees that can be the dominants in the, in the forest. In the spruce fir, higher elevation, there are only two. In the northern hardwood forests of New England that extends on down into the mountains, there are just a few species such as beech and sugar maple and yellow birch. But here there are these 10 plus all of these associates such as yellowwood and such as the hickories, certain hickories. And among these species that are very frequent are these indicator species, namely basswood, which we've been walking by and which I pointed out to you earlier. Mm -hmm. There was a method to doing it early to get you thinking about or recognizing that earlier. And also yellow buckeye. Here is the yellow buckeye with the leaflets, all these five mm -hmm. leaf appearing ones are part of a leaflet which has what we call palmate leaves like the hand, fingers of your hand. Yeah. Those are the indicator trees along with um, a silver bell which we pointed out earlier on the trail and several times on the trail. Then in addition is Eriodendron tulipifera which is also a major constituent. So is white oak. So is American beech. We saw two American beeches earlier. Uh, we haven't. They're not in front of us right this minute that I see. They're very slick bark, gray, gray bark, covered with lichens typically as they get older. Okay. And then <laughs> you got these other, you got these other associates such as this birch that are and yellow wood that are a part of the canopy. But the big ones that I was mentioning, the ten or so, include the ones that I just mentioned: basswood, buckeye, tulip, poplar, uh, white oak, and formerly, I uh, got to talk about that briefly, and that's American chestnut. We have been looking for root sprouts of American chestnut ever since we got out of the car. Because commonly we'll see one somewhere along the way. Because American chestnut was a major tree of this forest, comprising 10 to 20 percent of the forest. And on the ridges up slope, it could be up to 90 percent. It was a major tree at the time of settlement was a major tree until the early part of the 19th, of the tw yeah, 20th century when a blight coming in from somewhere, uh, Europe in particular, uh, appeared first in the New York Botanical Garden and it spread rapidly from 1904 to 
1930, this tree, which was major in our forest, was eliminated virtually. There are very few adults that survived this chestnut blight. And it, and it was uh, an ecological disaster because, one, it was a regular nut producing tree that wildlife depended on it. Settlers depended on it because it was easy to work. It also a food source. It was also the gathering of these nuts and turning them in, to, taking them to the store to trade for sugar and flour and other things. That was extraordinarily important. And in the 30s, that kind of system still existed. So the tree is gone. It is one that uh, has been, the, the uh, stems are long gone. The only thing we see now are these sprouts that come up from the root system. And it has been replaced chiefly by red maple. Instead of having nuts, which animals mm -hmm. eat, Mm -hmm. Red maple has these winged fruit that virtually nobody eats. Some birds do. There's another group of animals that do, but it, by and large, it is not a major uh, food source for anybody. And it was an ecological disaster. Remains one in that that impact of the forest that happened nearly uh, happened 80 years ago is still being felt in the forest, and I would argue, as I have every time I open my mouth about it, is that mm -hmm. it is just import as big a disaster as the Gulf oil spill. We talk about that being a disaster, mm -hmm. but this was bigger because it is so long-lasting and over such a wide range from New England to here and westward. So it was a major major uh, element of, of our forest today that affects, greatly affects the composition of it and what's here. Hemlock was the eastern uh, far, uh, the cove hardwood forest, mixed mesophytic forest, that was the only evergreen that was in this forest. The pines were not here, none of them, except in the Carolinas you pick up white pine but certainly the other pines are not a part of it. And you see this hemlock that's dead right mm -hmm. back here. And it's just throughout the whole system. Sugar maple was important. I, I mentioned American beech. So you've got this very complex mixed mesophytic forest. And Lucy Brown thought that it was the mother forest of the world. But that is not at all of that's been changed now, but nonetheless, what she did in the 20s and 30s was to introduce the scientific community, if not the general public, to it. And she worked as a, in conservation, trying to preserve as much of it as she could in, in Kentucky, and failed at every turn of the wheel because the timber companies and those that owned the woods didn't care. And so, with the very few exceptions. We have just a few hundreds of acres of the old growth forest left in Kentucky that is representative. Mm -hmm. And here we have 500,000 acres of the national park, 25% of it being the old growth. This is headed toward old growth. This is better than what it was down the slope because you have large trees then you have a scattering of trees of other sizes. And so that is what we call uneven aged, different ages represented. Mm -hmm. Whereas down below, remember I pointed out that I said all that poplar looks about the same. It doesn't here, so it's headed that way. But this was also logged or something. Something happened that took the, took the timber because otherwise the tulip poplar wouldn't be so plentiful had to be that way. So that's generally a very brief summary of what is known as mixed mesophytic and as well of the cove hardwood and American chestnut. Today the hemlock woolly adelgid is doing the same number on hemlock. The hemlock's far more restricted than where it is. That is, it's along streams and in these cool environments 
and doesn't have as wide a range as American chestnut did. But it's important from the standpoint of especially the uh, stream side because the, as the hemlock dies, the water temperature changes and that changes the entire aquatic system. But chestnut was used for everything. And it was a multi-billion multi dollar industry that ranged from tannins for the production of leather to house construction, uh, millions of miles across ties. All of that stuff is what uh, Chestnut supported. Mm -hmm. Pat, you were asking something? No, I was going to say that the loss of the hemlock is going to be a huge impact on the forest because it is usually down in cooler places so it's going to warm up even the, the spring ephemerals may change too the, the aquatic the aquatic issue is, is what a lot of the concern is about is what's it going to do to the aquatic insects and to the small fish that live in those streams because red maple and tulip tree and others will move in in these forests here it'll be fairly quick to fairly quickly replaced as a tree, but not of the same quality and quantity as eastern hemlock. No development to um, uh, around the uh, chestnut blight? Oh yeah, that's another story. There's, okay. there's a lot of activity in trying to replace American chestnut and breed it with Chinese chestnut so that it can be uh, reintroduced as a species but it's not going to happen in mine in your lifetime. And uh, certainly for those people that are uh, even 20 years old, I think it'll take a good long time before this becomes any kind of uh, important uh, project in terms mm -hmm. of widespread development on it.